Welcome to the Truth and Liberty broadcast. We believe we have a mandate to bring godly change to our nation and the world through the seven spheres or mountains of influence. To further this cause, we give away a product every week that will empower you to get involved in changing your life and changing our world. You can register for our weekly giveaway by subscribing at truthandliberty.net. You can also subscribe to our newsletter to receive weekly updates on guests, news, and much more. This is an interactive live cast and we welcome your questions. To ask a question during the live cast, use the comment or chat features. Now get ready to dive into this week's topics with our hosts on location in Colorado, USA. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Truth and Liberty Livecast. I'm Richard Harris, and I am here with our co-host, Kim Kohler, tonight. And uh, Kim, it's great to have you on set with us Thank tonight. You. Kim is the coordinator of the Practical Government School at Karis Bible College, and uh, sure do love the Practical Government School. Um, I had the blessing of being the first coordinator, the job that yeah, you've got now. Your coordinator, <laughs> you were in the first class. Yes. So uh, Kim is awesome. She, um, uh, I'm gonna let her make some announcements and stuff here in just a second, but first I wanna tell you guys that we're also excited tonight to have Tim Barton with us. He's gonna be our guest tonight, and uh, uh, we'll go. I'll give Tim a proper introduction Introduction here in just a second, but um, really excited to have him on board. So, Kim, you've got some information to share with our viewers, so I'll just kick it over to you. And thank you. Um, yeah, go yes, ahead. I do have some announcements. The first one is we want to invite you to the Truth and Liberty uh, Pastors Resource page. We prepared some pastor resources just for you, and it will help you to stand for biblical truth. So, you're going to go to the Pastors Resource page at truthandliberty.net. And coming here on March 9th through the 11th at Karis Bible College, we have Men's Advance. This is such a great event for men. Uh, Andrew Womack is one of the speakers, Jeremy Pearsons, E.W. Jackson, and Billy Epperhart. And you can register for that event at awmi.net slash events. And if you've ever thought of going to Karis Bible College and wondered what it was like, we invite you to join us for campus days, March 15th through the 17th. Andrew Womack will be speaking and so will uh, Carrie Pickett. Pickett. Um, you can register for that at awm.net slash events. We also have the Empowered Conference coming up, and that is March 29th through April 1st. If you're looking for a global awakening, revival training, this is a conference for you. Uh, speakers include Dr. Randy Clark, uh, Mike Hutchins, and Dr. Rodney Hoag. And you can register for that at awmi.net slash events. And then just the week before Easter, we invite you to come up to the Karis Bible College campus for God With Us. That's a play uh, that'll be playing April 7th through the 8th. It's a musical and it's an experience like none other. It's a play that's written by Robert and Elizabeth Murin. And it's absolutely fantastic. You can reserve your seats at awmi.net slash events. And every week here on the show, we invite you to register as a new subscriber. And what we do is we hold a drawing and you can have a chance to win, it, win one of our books. Last week, um, last week we gave away Effortless Change by Andrew, but this week it is Spirit, Soul, and Body. And our last week's winner was uh, Beth Woodward. So Beth, congratulations on that. If you'd like to be eligible to, uh, to subscribe and, and have a chance for the drawing, go to truthandliberty.net uh, slash subscribe. Now we also invite you to interact with us here during this live cast. So we'd like you to bring your questions to us. You're gonna go into the live chat at truthandliberty.net slash live and leave your comments there or go on Facebook and leave, leave a comment in the Facebook uh, uh, comment section and then we'll try to get your questions towards the end of the, of the live cast. We also would like to invite you to become a member of Truth and Liberty, where you can donate. Now the donations are not tax deductible, but if you donate $5 or more, you can be subscribed, you can be helping to support this great broadcast. And then we will give you this constitution book just for, uh, for donating. You can also give to our foundation, which is truthandliberty.foundation, and that is tax deductible. We also want to pray for you. So if you're watching the live stream, we would like to pray for you tonight. There's a prayer button that's on awmi.net. Just click the prayer button, leave your prayer request there. Or for live prayer, call the Andrew Womack Ministries helpline at 719-635-1111, and we will pray with you. All right, Kim, well, thank you for that. I appreciate it so much. And uh, I'm just super excited tonight 
that uh, to have Tim Barton joining us. Tim has uh, come to be a good friend. Of course, uh, his dad and his whole family, they are amazing friends and partners of this ministry uh, and of Truth and Liberty. I don't even know if uh, we would have the Practical Government School or Truth and Liberty without David Barton and that whole family. They uh, almost built the curriculum there uh, single-handedly. And uh, last year, Tim and I traveled the state of Colorado doing pastor's meetings and all kinds of stuff. It's just, he's a great friend and a good partner. He's the president of Wall Builders, and uh, Wall Builders is, uh, uh, presents America's forgotten history and heroes with an emphasis on our religious, moral, and constitutional heritage. And I like telling everybody that, that Tim, that you're, uh, you guys have the largest private collection of original artifacts, books, and materials from America's founding era outside of the Smithsonian Institution. That is an amazing fact. Yeah, to our knowledge, uh, it is the largest private collection of original documents from the founding era. Just to be clear, some people have bigger collections, just not from stuff of the founding fathers. Uh, and it really is a blessing to be able to, to store those things and certainly to research and read and then share as many of those stories as we possibly can. Well, welcome to the show, brother. I'm so glad you're here. I, I want you to just take a minute and tell people a little bit more about Wall Builders. Um, now, what's your website and everything like that, and uh, what can they expect to find there? Yeah, well, and, and I apologize, uh, Richard, Kim, it's great to see you guys. Great to be with you tonight. Thanks for having me on. Uh, so for anybody interested, wallbuilders.com is our website. Uh, we do a lot with American history, as maybe you've already gathered. Maybe you're familiar with us. Hopefully you are. Uh, but wallbuilders.com is the best place to go to find out more information. We're all over social media. We have a daily radio program. So there's a lot of ways you can find and connect with us. The, the, the name Wall Builders, also important that it comes from the Bible book of Nehemiah. So if you remember the story of Nehemiah, where he was the one that really Really felt called to go rebuild the walls of Jerusalem after they had been conquered, destroyed. They've been in captivity for many decades. And he called everybody to come back and live inside the walls of Jerusalem. He says, just come back and live in the city. Everybody do what you can. And, and together, let's rebuild this wall. Back in the 80s, my dad really felt that God had called him to uh, the same kind of vision of Nehemiah to help rebuild and restore the foundation of America. Because even in the 80s, it was obvious and apparent to him that the religious, the moral, the constitutional foundations of the nation were under attack. And so since the 80s, he's been working to try to, to gather people that let's come and rebuild this place that God has called us to be America and try to restore that foundation. So that's a lot of what we do. Uh, one of the, the things that just recently we've, we've done actually as the, the month of February is finishing and we're looking at kind of the idea of Black History Month going on, we decided that we should reintroduce people to a lot of the great American heroes, black patriots, uh, black entrepreneurs, black soldiers, and just incredible contributors to America that a lot of people have never heard of. As we see the, the 1619 narrative being pushed or critical race theory being promoted uh, really all over universities, all over public schools in the United States, one of the things that we've encouraged people to do is if you just go back and actually study history, it's very easy to show why those notions are historically very inaccurate, but so often people don't know where to look. They don't know what the stories are. So we decided that we would pick 20 heroes and every Monday through Friday, you can learn a new hero. We did videos on our social media platforms, but also we did printed packets and we work with a lot of state legislators. Actually in all 50 states, we're connected with state legislators. We work with a lot of teachers all around the US. We do teachers conferences every summer we do legislative conference every fall. And so we thought this is something that teachers can use in their classroom. This is something that legislators can actually use, not only in their district, but even if, if they want to get up every morning from the floor of their house or their Senate, and they just want to take a moment of personal privilege, they can actually read this story. So it can go on a record, whether it be a, a James Armistead Lafayette or a Bass Reeves or a Robert Smalls or a, a stagecoach Mary Field. There are so many incredible heroes and contributors to America that we don't know about. And so so that was something that we just recently did. In fact, if you want to know more, you can go to wallbuilders.com or our social media pages. You can check out those videos, learn about some of these great American heroes. And we are constantly trying to, to put out the truth of American history, tell people understand who America actually is, where we came from, not glossing over the fact that America is not perfect because America is full of people just like every other nation and people aren't perfect. But America is unique in the way that God used Americans, in the way that God's blessed the world through America, but also the way that, that God used the founding fathers to establish a biblical foundation for America that's allowed America to become the most free, prosperous, and stable nation in the history of the world. And those are part of the stories we try to tell. 
Wow, that's fantastic. So um, the, the, the wall builder's site is so full of resources and information. I think, you know, it could take months to get through it all, probably years. I don't know. I know, you know, we, uh, when our kids were little uh, and we were homeschooling, wall builder's material, your dad's DVDs and books and stuff like that were go-to resources, not just for us, but for our homeschooling friends. What's available for parents and educators on your site, Tim? And because uh, I have a lot of people asking me these days, where do I go to get the truth? Yeah, so I, I think one of the best resources that, that we've ever done uh, was a book that came out just a couple years ago called The American Story. We're actually working on the second book in that series. And the idea was we, we wanted to, to tell people the story again. One of the things that we often say in our presentation is Americans just don't know the truth of our history. And we try to introduce that to people, but we, we had never written an actual history book. So the American story is an actual history book. It goes in chronological order from Columbus all the way up, really. We were going to stop with uh, George Washington becoming president, so kind of America becomes this nation under this incredible leader, George Washington. And we were finishing the book in 2019, and that's when the 1619 Project was coming out. And they, of course, were saying America was birthed on slavery and rooted on slavery. And we, the reason we fought the American Revolution was to preserve and protect and expand slavery. And we just thought we can't let them get away with this nonsense. So we decided to take the book at least a, a quick overview to the ending of slavery in America and show the abolition movement in America and how the majority of founding fathers came out against slavery. And they laid the political foundation ultimately for the ending of slavery in America. By 1804, every single northern colony had passed laws for the abolition of slavery, which was 30 years roughly before England ended slavery. Uh, all the northern colonies in America had already ended slavery. America was the first nation to sign a law banning the slave trade. Thomas Jefferson signed that law on March 2nd, 1807. England signed their law on March 21st, 1807. And so we just go through telling the story that today, most people have no idea that America literally was the world leader in the anti-slavery abolition movement because today all we hear is how evil we were. So this first book goes from Columbus to the ending of slavery in America. The second book, we're gonna actually back up to where we were thinking we were gonna finish with George Washington becoming president. And we're gonna start from his presidency and we're gonna go through probably the next seven presidents telling their story. But that's one of the best resources I would encourage people to look into because it is written in a, a very simple story form. So it, it's, it's not your general academic book. It's not just names and dates and places. We are literally telling the stories of these people, of their adventures. When people look at Christopher Columbus and, and they think he's evil and did all these evil things, well, the questions that we should ask is, well, when did he do those things? And people would say, well, when he went to America. And we would ask, well, which voyage? And most people don't even know that Columbus had more than one voyage. He had four voyages. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know that he had four voyages, you certainly don't know what happened on those voyages. And if you don't know the story of Columbus, you don't really know if he's guilty of all the things he's accused of or not, which kind of as a newsflash, he's not guilty of most of the crimes and sins he's accused of. But we tell the story so you can see, and we tell it just like, we try to tell it like the Bible tells us a story of King David where you realize that this is a man after God's own heart. There's, there's nobody like this guy. He's an incredible worshiper. He's an amazing warrior, but he definitely had his flaws, right? We, we know that David had some major sinful moments in his life, not the least of which is when he has the affair with Bathsheba and then has her husband Uriah assassinated, murdered, bumped off. This guy had some major issues, and yet God used him in incredible ways. And this is the way we try to tell the story, not glossing over the fact that these guys weren't perfect, but God used them in amazing ways. We also have a resource called the Founders Bible, uh, mm -hmm. which is a really neat resource as we talk about the founding fathers being so influenced by the Bible. The Founders Bible is a normal Bible, but as you go through the commentary, and there's hundreds of articles in there, it is where we are taking letters from the founding fathers where they would talk about how this verse shaped their public policy this verse shaped what they did in business or agriculture or whatever it might be we put that quote that letter by that verse so as you read through the bible you actually can then see beside the verse the founding fathers talking about how that verse or that principle from that verse impacted them and what they did in shaping and forming America. So those, those are the top two resources I'd point people to. There's a ton of free resources available on our website as well. A lot of articles, all of it's footnoted and documented. So if you need to have a conversation with your friends, if you want to engage in some of this discussion on whether it be the 1619 Project or Critical Race Theory or Christopher Columbus or George Washington, 
I mean, kind of any topic you can pick, we've written articles about and we footnote it all. So we encourage people, don't take our word for this. In fact, doubt everything we say, go look at the footnotes, go read the original sources. Because once you've re read the original sources, once you've discovered truth for yourself, then you will have much more confidence than just saying, well, I heard Tim Barton, I heard David Barton say this one time. Don't take our word for it. We will point you to the original sources and once you've discovered the original sources, again, you can have a lot more confidence resting in that truth and even having the boldness and courage to speak the truth because you've done that research and found it for yourself. Yeah, that, that's awesome, Tim. I, you know, uh, I've been with you guys at events where, uh, you, you know, you're, you're speaking and presenting and then you're, you reach down into a bag or something and you pull out some letter and you say, well, this is the letter that uh, George Washington was holding in that painting over there, we might, like in the rotunda. And, and it's like, is that, that's a copy, right? No, no, this is the letter. And, uh, you know, it's really incredible. Uh, it's a, you guys are truly an American treasure and we're so thankful for that. Um, you know, my son, I was telling you before we came on, is um, he's actually uh, in France right now, and uh, he was having a conversation with some fellow students at the language school that he's attending, and he, um, or, or whether this was prudent for him to do or not, he stood up in the middle of the common area, and he said to all these missionaries, America's the greatest nation in the world. And um, most of these were young Americans uh, in this school, and he got a lot of flack from them as they were saying, how can you say that America's not great? America's done all these things. They've you know, caused slavery and all this sort of stuff. He, one of the points he made to them was that America's the only nation in the world that ever fought a war to end slavery. Um, you know, this 1619 project, Tim, can you just take a minute and, and tell us why it's uh, not something that should be taught in our schools? What's wrong with this whole concept of the 1619 project? Yeah, absolutely. So the 1619 project, what the claim is, is that America was birthed, and this is the claim, when the first shipload of African slaves arrived on American soil in 1619. Now, first of all, that is not when the first shipload of African slaves arrived on American soil. If you remember when Columbus discovers the New World, he actually arguably maybe landed on the North American continent on his fourth voyage. We know his first three voyages for sure. He was landing on islands in, in, in the Caribbean, uh, the Caribbean area, but he discovers this new world. And at that point, nobody uh, in, in that area of Europe was familiar with this new world with North America. So it led to colonization, but also keep in mind, Columbus was an Italian, but he, he sailed for the Spanish. The Spanish, and the reason this matters, the Spanish were one of the major slave traders of the day. That The African slave trade arguably starts when some of the North African nations, that the Muslim nations of North Africa, begin exporting African slaves. And then when there is a business, right, and there's profit to be made, other people are gonna jump on board. And that's when you have the Portuguese and the Dutch and the Spanish and other nations get involved in the slave trade. Well, the Spanish were some of the biggest slave traders there were. Columbus sailed for Spain, the Spaniards. And so the Spanish were actually some of the first ones to begin establishing colonies, even in the New World, actually in North America, whether it be in, in South Carolina in the 1520s or in Florida in the late 1500s, there were multiple colonies they established. And in all of their colonies, they brought with them slaves, black slaves from Africa. We actually have uh, documents in, in a collaborative collection that in, in Florida, the governor of Florida actually approved in 1610, this is the official government document, approved in 1610, that in Florida they could participate in trades of gold, silver, and African slaves in 1610. So the idea that the first shipload of slaves arrived in in Jamestown in 1619, that was the first time African slaves had reached this continent. That, that's ridiculous. Now, maybe the first time they reached an English colony, maybe, but even then there's reason for doubt. But what the 1619 claims is that this is when America was really birthed and that everything about America was built on the backs of slaves and America promoted slavery, encouraged slavery. Actually, the, the 1619's project, there was an article, and it was one of the very first articles written they said the founding fathers, they actually fought the American Revolution to protect and preserve the institution of slavery because they knew if they didn't win their independence, they were going to lose their slaves. Now, if anybody's ever read the Declaration, there's 27 grievances in the Declaration that were all problems we had with the king, the reasons we wanted to separate from the king, or you can go back to the original draft. There was 24 grievances, and there's a few differences between those 24 and then the final 27. In neither the first draft or the final draft, does any founding father 
And in fact, not even during the debates does any founding father mention the reason they wanted to fight the revolution was to preserve and protect the institution of slavery. In fact, the opposite is true. In the original draft of the Declaration, the largest grievance in the original draft of the Declaration was that the founding fathers wanted to end the slave trade. They wanted to end slavery. And up, oh, did you guys lose my feed? It appears so. Um, there <laughs> okay. we go. Well, well, we've still got your uh, audio, I, so go ahead. They'll try to fix well, here's it. Here's the guess. deal. Are, are they working on it? Sorry, guys. I apologize to all the viewers out there. I have no idea what's going on. I'm going to walk to my camera and see if we can fix this. It is a first time problem. I haven't had that happen before. Okay, so well, what we're talking about here is the 1619 project that is being promoted in pretty much the public schools uh, and in the universities of this nation, even though it's my understanding it's been debunked uh, as, as historically inaccurate. Um, I think, Tim, you'd probably agree that it's, it's really um, uh, an invention of the progressive left trying to promote the idea that America is a systemically racist country um, so that they can divide and subvert uh, the, uh, the Republican institutions that, uh, that were built on. We've got your video back now. so. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I did the amazing technological thing of turning it off and then back on again, and well, it that worked. Was that was fast, so good job. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, so God willing, it will stay on and work this time. Uh, yeah, so, so to your point, right, the, the, the 1619 Project, just like if, if you go back to the founders of BLM, um, or even the 1619 Project, they will tell you that they are fans of Marxism and socialism and communism and that America's fundamentally evil. Well, this is literally the foundation of Marxism is you want to divide nations or you want to divide a nation in general into groups and then you want to set the groups against each other. Well, that's what the 1619 Project is trying to do. They're trying to say in this Marxist ideology that all white people's legacy is in a legacy of slavery and all dark people or specifically all black people's heritage is a heritage of being enslaved. And, and in Marxism, it paints the picture that you are, there's only two classes. You're either the, the oppressed or the oppressor. And what they're doing in the 1619 Project is they're saying that all white people were oppressors and all black people were the oppressed. And that's part of this movement. It's part of critical race theory as well, which is absolutely rooted in Marxism. Critical race theory derives from critical theory. And critical theory was the foundational thought of this Marxist idea and regime. But it's all linked together as we look at this, and it is done to divide America. So first of all, the 1619 Project is incredibly historically inaccurate. It's not correct at all. But then to go even further, not only is it not correct, it was never intended to be correct. One of the things that, that uh, Hannah Nicole Jones came out and said is that she was not, there was so much criticism from actual historians saying that what they were doing with the 1619 Project, that, that they were so wrong in what they said. And she said, look, I wasn't, I wasn't claiming that everything about this was correct. She said, I was trying to start a new conversation so that Americans could see slavery from a new light. Now, wait a second. I, I thought you were trying to tell the truth about slavery. And she literally says that the goal was just to start a conversation to make people see things in a new light. Well, this is that Marxist propaganda. We're not trying to promote the truth anymore. We're trying to promote a ideology that would lead to a political end. And this is what communists and socialists and Marxists do. And this is where the great danger is, not just that the 1619 Project is historically inaccurate, but that is it is a wolf in sheep's clothing bringing in this notion of Marxism where it is literally peddling this oppressed ideology and oppressor ideology where over the last couple of years, there, there have been elementary school kids. There's been news reports on this. This is not hard for people to look up and find where there's little white kids that were going home and they were crying and their parents asked them why. And they said, well, because my, my teacher said I was, I was wrong. I was evil because the color of my skin. When you're telling a little white kid who has never enslaved anybody that they're evil because they enslave people, okay, obviously that, that, that is a major problem. Not to mention, if we, if we honestly studied history, if you go to the 1800s and understand there was a group of Americans that were in favor of slavery. There was another group of Americans that opposed slavery. In fact, the majority of abolitionists were white. The great leaders were white abolitionists. Now, certainly we can talk about a Frederick Douglass, there's other people as well, but when you're looking at who got the laws changed, the, the people who were voting in those legislatures, the people who in Congress, who, 
Who was it that voted to end the, the, the slave trade or, to, excuse me, to end slavery with the 13th Amendment? If you go back and check the records of Congress, it, it was white anti-slavery congressmen who voted for the 13th Amendment. But this is part of the truth the 1619 Project doesn't want to talk about because they don't want to imagine in Marxist ideology that there can be some good and some bad people. It's, it's, it's actually about the individual. It's not about the color of the skin because in Marxism, you have to be put in a group and the group you are in is the most important thing. That's the bigger battle we are fighting with the 1619 Project and critical race theory. Well, so I, I wish we had all the time in the world to talk about this because I'd love to dive in deeper. But one of the things, um, that if you can real quickly just tell people about two things, two historical things. One is the, the original draft of the declaration that Jefferson wrote had a big clause in it about uh, slavery and pointing out that the King of England, one of the, the problems was that the King would veto the efforts of the colonies to outlaw slavery. Um, if you could talk about that. And then also, um, what is this thing called the three-fifths rule in the Constitution? And is that actually pro-slavery or properly understood, is it anti-slavery? Yeah, okay, so, so let's go back. So I actually, I have the first printed copy of the original draft of the Declaration of Independence uh, sitting on a table right over there. I was very tempted to get up and get off camera again, but we've already had camera issues, so I'm just gonna stay here. <laughs> but this is something people can actually look up online. You, you can go uh, multiple places online, look up original draft of the declaration, you'll find a high res image of it, and you'll see it's four pages. On the third, so the, the first page, just to walk through this kind of sequentially, on the first page is where Jefferson lays out the political philosophy of the American government. Phrases we would know, like, we hold these truths to be self-evident, all men are created equal. That appears on the first page. The second page, he begins listing the grievances of all the issues we have with the king. On the third page, he continues with the grievances, all the issues we have with the king. And then the fourth page is his political summation, uh, the conclusion, if you will, of the declaration. The last grievance in the original draft is the largest grievance. It's like a third of the page, maybe even more than a third of the page. It, it, it's massive, this grievance. And he goes through explaining that the king had waged a cruel war against human nature itself, violating his most sacred rights of life and liberty in the persons of a distant people who never offended him. He captured them. He, he carried them away into slavery in another hemisphere where they would be either enslaved or they would incur a miserable death in their transportation thither. He goes to and explains the slave trade and that the king of England was doing the slave trade. Well, well then he actually goes on and says that the king has enslaved these men. And, and the word men, again, I encourage everybody to look this up. The word men is fully capitalized, capital M, capital E, capital N. And Jefferson's talking about these Africans who had been enslaved. He says he's enslaved these men. Now, why that really matters is in the declaration when Jefferson wrote that all men are created equal, one of the arguments from people with the 1619 Project or people that promote critical race theory is they say when Jefferson said that all men are created equal, he was only talking about white people. No, he wasn't. Go back and read the original draft. Literally, the word men in that grievance is fully capitalized, capital M-E-N, and he was talking about the slaves being taken out of Africa. He said they were men. He, he was acknowledging their humanity. Well, then the grievance went further, and Jefferson explained that the king had suppressed every legislative attempt made by the colonies to stop this inexorable commerce, just to stop the evil of the slave trade, meaning that the colonies had begun passing laws saying that, right, Pennsylvania, we will no longer allow the slave trade in Pennsylvania. And the king says, you, you can't end this slave trade. You're an English colony. The, the slave trade is part of the English system. You can't end part of our system. And this is what led many founding fathers to say, well, this is one more reason we actually should separate from the king right now. Virginia passed an anti-slave trade law. There were states already doing this. And so when Jefferson writes the original draft of the declaration, he was including all of the things they'd been discussing and debating and saying, let's, let's include all the ideas in here. John Hancock was the president of Congress at that time. John Hancock said they would only include in the final draft of the declaration what had been unanimously agreed to by all the delegates. Jefferson wrote that when it came to the anti-slave trade grievance, the anti-slavery grievance, that there were two colonies that did not support it. Georgia and South Carolina, Jefferson says both of them at that time said that because they had not yet tried to abolish a slave trade or end slavery in their own colonies, that this was not a grievance they had with the king and they did not think it needed to be included. So John Hancock said, well, we won't include it. It's not unanimous. And why that mattered, John Hancock said, if we include things that aren't unanimous, the king might be able to come in and pull us apart by our own local separate interests. So we have to be united so the king can't divide us. So it was a, a very wise, logical decision. 
But there were only two colonies that opposed that, which means 11 colonies voted in favor of it. The vast majority of the founding fathers and of the states were in a position. They were ready to end the slave trade and the king would not let them. Well, that's actually part of the original draft of the declaration. It just didn't make it in the final draft because it wasn't unanimous. But let's go in the constitution. You, you mentioned the three fifths clause. If somebody actually goes and reads the three fifths clause, it's pretty clarifying because it's actually talking about population. And it says that in the pro-slavery in the Southern states, that they were only allowed to count three fifths of their slaves in the census because based on the population is how many representatives they were gonna have in Congress. And the compromise was, so, so the anti-slavery founding fathers from the North said, well, you shouldn't count any of your slaves. And the pro-slavery founding fathers from the South said, we should count all of them. And they began bickering back and forth. And one of the, there's actually some great records uh, from the debates in the, uh, the, the uh, Constitutional Convention about this, where some of the founding fathers, and I wanna say, I wanna say it was maybe New Hampshire, Rhode Island, Connecticut, I don't remember which founding father and where they were, but it was one of the Northern states. And they said, well, if we get to count all our property, then I should be able to count all of my forks and my knives and my spoons and my, <laughs> my horses and my cows, because you say that those men are nothing more than property, and yet you want to include them in your representation for your population. Well, this is the debate that went back and forth. And so the compromise was that they could only count three fifths of their slaves in their population that determined how many representatives they got. What people say today is, well, the founding fathers thought a black person was only three fifths of a person. That's not at all what it says. It literally was a compromise to limit the power of the pro-slavery founding fathers from the Southern states. This was an anti-slavery clause. It was a compromise trying to limit the power, but it said they would count three fifths of the slaves in the overall population. Not that slaves were three fifths of a person. And because people, most people, they've never read the constitution or they, they don't remember reading it. They don't remember that clause. They don't know what it actually says. Again, if you actually just go and read it, it's pretty clear. They don't say that a black person is only three fifths of a person. They say that you can only count three fifths of the slaves in the population for the census that would give you your representatives. It, it was an anti-slavery clause. And because we don't know history or we don't read the constitution very much, we don't recognize that. And this is where the 1619 Project and critical race theory proponents argue and articulate the, the pro-racist founding fathers when really, if we just could go back and, and read the documents and study history, we would realize the vast majority of the founding fathers were not pro-slavery and they weren't racist. It's just, we don't really know history or know their stories anymore. And that's why so many of the rising generation are being misled is because they don't know the truth. Mm, yeah, that's amazing. Um, well, I'd like to, we've got a little bit of time before we need to start taking some questions, Tim. And I just wanted to shift kind of to current uh, events here and and talk a little bit about this uh, what looks like a real revival that has broken out on college campuses in America, beginning at Asbury College in Kentucky, Wilmore, Kentucky, uh, that um, a sort of a spontaneous student-led worship service went day and night for 11 days, I think, or, or longer before the school had to say, we got to get back to classes now. And it's spread to numerous other campuses. What, do you, what are your thoughts about this, brother? What's going on? Is this the beginning of a real uh, revival? And if it is, um, you know, just comment on that. What do we need to do as the church? And, uh, you know, you guys are experts in history. You've studied the first Great Awakening, second Great Awakening. What do you see here? So and I love we to talk about this. This is a great topic. I think, unfortunately, there have been so many what we would call like armchair quarterbacks uh, analyzing Asbury. And I've seen so many people critical yep. of Asbury. Well, it can't be a real revival or it's, it's not really. The, I mean, it's, it's so silly. The reality is God was doing something. And whether or not you like all the theology of Asbury or not, it doesn't negate the fact that God was moving and doing something. And now the fact, as you mentioned, it spread to more than 20 campuses. And some of these campuses, like at Texas A&M, yeah. that's, that's not the place you would think, like that's, that's not a Bible college, right? And yet we are seeing God move in lots of ways in lots of places. As you look back historically, one of the things that we would point to is that revivals lasted for decades. And, and so I actually think this is not the beginning of revival. I think this is signs, uh, continual signs that we are in a revival, mm -hmm. but revivals aren't just reflected by God moving or God, an outpouring of God's spirit in, in a place at a specific time. What is much more conducive for a revival and 
the first and second great awakening were known as great revivals but really they were then ch the name changed to awakening because of what happened in the culture there was a cultural mm -hmm. awakening mm -hmm. and during those those great awakenings the first and second great awakening there was debates over issues of truth and morality and in the midst of debating truth and morality there was people that entered on landed on both sides of the debate of well this is true that's not true this is what the bible says that's not what the bible says this is the easiest see to see this is in the second great awakening with the issue of slavery where you had some some genuine christians that were pastors in the south that said right slavery's in the bible god allows slavery slavery's fine you shouldn't be against it and pastors in the north have said that was never god's design that was part of the fall of man god's design was freedom and and so there were debates over this but the point was they were actually discussing and debating pertinent things in culture in the midst of this god's spirit was moving and god was opening people's eyes to truth that they had never seen before if you look at, at some of both george whitfield and charles finney but even as we're talking about the asbury revival as it's we're kind of knowing it now francis asbury who, who asbury is named after asbury college asbury seminary is named after francis asbury well during george whitfield during francis asbury or charles finney there were moments when the spirit of god would be poured out and people actually would speak in other tongues they would speak in different languages there would be healings there would be miracles and and it didn't last for for weeks or months or years it would last for a moment but what happened is when that's when the, the spirit of god was poured out in a place in that town it began to change the hearts and minds of people in that town and that town there was there was a cultural transformation there was an awakening in that town and the reason it was a great awakening is because these awakenings were happening in so many places that over 20 30 40 50 years in in the second great awakening or over 20 or 30 years in the first great awakening eventually it had happened in enough places that enough people were beginning to to have their eyes open to be awakened to truth to be awakened to righteousness to be awakened to morality what was actually right and wrong that there was a cultural transformation and shift and i think mm -hmm. what we are seeing we, we could go back to the supreme court just last summer where right so many within one week there were like these seven amazing victories from the U.S. Supreme Court, not the least of which was the overturning of Roe versus Wade. And I think it's it's really cool that at, we're now right not not even a year into Roe versus Wade being overturned. And this doesn't mean that abortions ended in America, but it does mean it's not federally protected anymore, which is wonderful news. But we're now seeing an outpouring of God's Spirit in multiple places. I, I think this is. This is one of the things we can see from the first and second great awakening is that it wasn't just an outpouring of god's spirit but there was political there were cultural things there was there was a shift in the nation mm -hmm. and the second great awakening again one of the easy shifts to point to is the issue of slavery where the abolition movement grew stronger and stronger and stronger now obviously there was a lot of conflict there was a lot of heat there was a lot of tension it led to the civil war the first great awakening there was a, a lot of heat and tension and for different reasons it actually at, at that time had a lot more to do with I don't know what my camera just went off again. God bless my camera. <laughs> <laughs> well, just keep talking if you can, Tim. We've got your picture up, so, well, we did. Perfect. <laughs> uh, okay, well, I, I mean, I, I probably look better with no picture anyway, so it's uh, <laughs> le less abrasive for the audience. Um, but in, in the first Great Awakening, you had a lot of you had a lot of issues between denominations where different denominations thought they were superior to another denomination and and george whitfield who was the the major leader of the first great awakening his one of his sermons that that he repeated often that, that many people reported documented hearing and preach was his father abraham sermon where he said that he had a vision and and, and he went to heaven and father abraham met him at the gates and he said father abraham now, now george whitfield is the founder of the methodist movement and, and he said father abraham where are my methodist brethren and Father Abraham said, there, there are no Methodists here. And, and, and Whitfield can't believe it. There's no Methodists in heaven. He said, well, where are my Wesleyan brothers? And Abraham says, there's no Wesleyans in heaven. And Whitfield starts going down these denominations. Well, where, where are the Baptists? Where, where, where are the Congregationalists? Where are the Quakers? Where, where? And he lists all these denominations. And Abraham says, none of them made it. And Whitfield says, then who makes it to heaven? And he said, Father Abraham told me, and then Whitfield would look at the crowd, and he would say, and you have the answer in my next text, which was from Acts. And he would read from Acts that he that feareth God and worketh righteousness should be accepted by him. Whitfield said, God, help us to forget our titles and be able to come and work together, kind of like the body of Christ, right? Come together as the body of Christ. 
Well, it was Whitfield that laid the foundation, not just for helping people recognize and remember the sovereignty of God, but for overcoming these superficial barriers that they had set up. This, this self-righteousness, that, that the man-made self-righteousness that their denomination was great and superior and these others were bad, whatever else. Well, it was because of the first great awakening, the founding fathers were able to find unity and only because of their unity were we able to come together in the American Revolution and find freedom. The first great awakenings, they laid a foundation ultimately for freedom. Freedom, the first great awakening laid foundation for freedom for America. The second great awakening laid the foundation for freedom for the slaves. Well, I think arguably, again, we are in the third great awakening mm. and, and, and people might argue there's more, but we are in a, an awakening. And I would yeah. think this one is freedom for the unborn because we are now seeing, right, a huge cultural shift. Although the battle's not over, there's still a lot going on, but this is part of what happens in awakenings. Yeah. That is so amazing. And um, hey, uh, we're going to go to some questions here in just a minute. Tim, I wanted to ask you uh, so the folks can see you, if you might check your the sleep settings on your computer there uh, and as to whether that might be what's causing your, uh, your picture to go out. But, um, you know, I think that on this subject of the third great awakening, you know, the Lord spoke to Andrew Womack last in March of 21 saying that he uh, that we are already in the third great awakening. And uh, I remember when Andrew announced that I was there, I heard him say it from the stage and I thought, oh boy, uh, this is right after the 2020 elections. And you know, no one felt like we were in any kind of revival or awakening. If anything, Kim, it felt like the opposite. Um, but yeah, these things take, and this is something we've learned from the Bartons is that real awakenings and revivals, the kinds that transform a nation, they, they usually last uh, decades. And uh, so, um, you know, it, it is, I think, just my two cents here. I think we are in the, in the awakening, and I think it's just the beginning. And it will be freedom for the unborn. Maybe it will also be a restoration of, uh, of some, some righteousness in our culture with respect to godly standards for family and other things. So, uh, so praise God for it is what I say. And, you know, one other thing is in, in pretty much all biblical revivals and, and in great awakenings, you know who opposes the awakening? The chief critics are usually the religious leaders of the day as because awakenings and revivals bring uh, uh, restoration to the church first and a correction of wrong thinking in the church. But hey, we've got a few minutes here uh, left. Kim, do we have any questions coming in? Yes, we have some great questions. All right. Uh, so Tim, the first question, do you believe that if we lose our liberties in America that the rest of the world will follow suit? I do. Uh, it doesn't mean that God can't raise up a, a, another bastion of freedom somewhere else. It would just be really sad if, if, if we lose freedom in our nation on our watch. Um, and and I, I do think right now the world looks so much to America. Be, the world is always going to have a leader. It's just a question of who is going to be the leader, right? It, it's kind of the notion, Dennis Prager just in the last week or two had a video where he was talking about some people say America shouldn't be so involved in other nations of the world, that we shouldn't be the police of the world. The reality is, and this is what Dennis Prager said, the reality is that somebody's going to be the police of the world. It's just a question of who. And if America is not setting an example on the world stage, well, who does that leave? China? Russia? It, it would be very bad for the rest of the world because whoever that nation is, they're going to promote their policies, their philosophy on the nations, the other nations of the world. And America, the, the philosophy of America is God-given rights, is freedom for the individual, is, is equality, is civility. That's not the standard of Russia or China or some other major player in the world. And, and so certainly, if, if we lose our freedom in America, if America goes under, which America's right, we're, we're not promised forever. And even God told the Israelites, Deuteronomy 28, I, I love the passage where Moses reminds them, right, guys, if you do what God says, you'll be blessed everywhere you go, everything you do. But if you reject God's ways, you can't outrun his curses. I, I, I know that God doesn't lie and he doesn't give his word in vain that this is this is part of the reality that when you do things God's way, you enjoy God's blessings. But when you don't do it God's way, you don't enjoy God's blessings. And that's where America is. And we're gonna have to figure out if we're gonna do it God's way or not. All that again to say, if we if we lose liberty in America, it is going to negatively impact everybody else in the world. Okay. Well, Kenny on Facebook says, what does all this talk that you're talking about with history have anything to do with God and God's ways? So, <laughs> where history is amazing, right? I mean, we could ask the same thing with, well, why should we read the Old Testament? Why should we learn the stories of the Old Testament? The reason we read it and learn the stories is not just to learn about a Bible hero. 
It's to learn about the character and nature of God, to learn how God used people, and to see the foundation that God laid, to learn lessons of what we should or shouldn't do. History should be no different regardless of where you are. History tells the story of what happens when you do things God's way or you don't do things God's way. It, it shows us examples of people who have been godly and not been godly, or people who maybe struggled in areas, but God still used them because God can use imperfect people and do amazing things through them. The reason the American story is also so significant is it shows a contrast, just like Israel showed a contrast to the Egyptians or, or right, really anybody else as you go through the Old Testament. The Israelites were different than the Philistines. They, they were different than the Amalekites. You can go through, they were different. America has been different than everybody else. And what we can point to is what's made America fundamentally different has been the influence of the Bible and Christianity in this nation. And to the degree that we have followed biblical principles has been the degree largely to which we have been blessed. And to the degree and having the leaders where we've rejected those principles, rejected that philosophy, we have lost some of those blessings along the way. And, and this is where America tells a beautiful story of that. And certainly having a foundation where America also is unique. One of the, the, the examples, the adages I've heard, I think is really a great example, is God, God made the nation of Israel because God wanted to have a people to himself. America made a nation because we wanted to follow God. And so America was a nation birthed on following God. Israel was a nation birthed by God. But this is where Israel and America have some similarities. But America is different because we're the first nation that said, we want to follow God and do it God's way. And of course, people would argue, but, but not everybody in America did it God's way. And we didn't always follow God's way. No, we didn't. And the kings of Israel didn't always do it God's way. And they didn't always follow God. That, that is totally true when you look at some of our leaders. And you can go through our presidents and see who did a great job, who didn't do a great job. But the reality is the foundation of our nation, the principles of our nation were built on the principles of the Bible and the principles of Christianity. Uh, and, and for people that want to know more information about that, definitely go to wallbuilders.com. There's a lot of great resources. I've already mentioned the American story, the Founders Bible, two great resources to help along the way. But if you don't want to buy something, just go read some of the articles we have and you can see documented from original sources what the founding fathers say about the foundation they laid and how the Bible actually influenced them. And that's where America's different. And that's part of why learning our history becomes so important because all also, Jesus talked about that he was the way, the truth, and the life. He said in John 8, 32, you would know the truth, and the truth would set you free. Well, truth doesn't just matter when it comes to theology. Truth matters in reality. And if we are lying about reality, if we're lying about history, truth matters. And this is also why it matters that we know the truth of American history. You know, I, I want to jump in on this one if I can, Tim. I, uh, I think you, you make uh, great points, but you know, I think the Bible does also uh, prohibit, it warns Israel, speaking of Israel, warn them against destroying the borders uh, and the monuments of their land. Uh, you know the, the verses I'm talking about, I can't quote them chapter and verse, but uh, the reason is because God wanted the people to, to have those, those landmarks so they could remember, they were set up to, right. to remind them as to what God did. And uh, that's what the left is trying to do in America today is to destroy, literally and physically now, tearing down statues. They, they want to destroy the landmarks of our history so that we don't remember who we are and our close connection to God. Um, come on, come in on that. But one other historical fact that I think is awesome is that when the founders uh, set about to create this new nation of ours, they decided, well, we have to have a seal, don't we? And Benjamin Franklin drew up one, and Thomas Jefferson drew up one, and both of them on the on one side of the seal commemorated the Hebrews' experience when they were delivered from Egypt. Can you comment on those uh, facts there? Absolutely. So yeah, when we separated from Great Britain in 1776, uh, there was a, com a three-person committee, uh, as you mentioned, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and John Adams were on that committee. And, and there were several committees and different committees. Some of them were giving overlapped uh, jobs. And, and one of the things that Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams thought is we need a new seal for our new nation. And Franklin suggested that they take the story of Moses and he said, our, our seal should be like this. It should show Moses standing on one side of the Red Sea, raising his rod with Pharaoh's army being overwhelmed by the sea. And, and behind you could have a, a, a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. And the motto would be rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. And that actually was Jefferson's, Jefferson wrote, that was his personal life motto. Rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. And the, the founding fathers definitely believed 
in having a biblical foundation in what they did to the point that even their their suggestion for the national motto was the story of Moses. And just like how God had delivered the Israelites out of Egypt, they believed that God could deliver them out of the king of England at that time. So it, it certainly has a biblical foundation. And Richard, as you mentioned, it is it is significant that when, when the Israelites first crossed over the Red Sea and, and, and Moses told them, leaders, go get a, a large stone and pile these stones up. And there's multiple times, by the way, when you go through the Old Testament where God told the Israelites to build an altar. And specifically, the reason was that one day when your kids come to you and say, hey, why is that over there? that you can tell them about what God did and how God delivered your ancestors. And you can again tell the story. If we don't know the history of America, then we will lose the ability to tell the story of what God did in the history of this nation. And as I mentioned, the founding fathers were very clear about building the nation on the foundation of biblical principles on the foundation of Christianity. It's equally clear that there are so many moments in the American Revolution alone, but we can look at all of American history, but in the American Revolution alone, there are dozens of stories where God divinely and supernaturally protected the American military in the revolution. And had it not been for God's intervention, our military would have been defeated. Washington would have been killed on multiple occasions. If we don't know the stories, then we will not be able to tell our kids one day, well, th this is about the time when God protected our leader, who was at that time a military commander, was going to go on to become our first president, George Washington. We need to learn the stories, just like the Israelites, so that one day when your kids come and say, tell us about this, it's not just about telling them about how great Joshua and Caleb were. It's about telling how great God was and how God used Joshua and Caleb in that moment. It's about telling how great God was and how God used George Washington in those moments. That's part of remembering the story so that we can continue the legacy of telling the greatness of God and what God did in our story here in America. You know, there's another, uh, I, I don't want to monopolize this, but there's another story in the Bible that I think is relevant on this. And it's, it's uh, I think it's the story of Isaac, um, uh, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so Abraham passes away and Isaac is left in the land. And there's a conflict that is beginning to brew between Isaac and his family and the the the, the Philistines at the time, uh, and they the Philistines plugged up the wells that Abraham had dug in the land. And so they, uh, Isaac and, and uh, Abimelech, I think it was, had words or whatever, and Isaac comes back in and has to unplug and dig up those wells in order for him to fulfill his purpose and mission in the land. I think that's what wall builders is all about, if I could be so bold to say that. You guys are unplugging the historical wells so we can tap into those things that made us a great nation in the first place. I, I think it's a great parallel. I mean, it, it, it's similar to the idea of wall builders, right? Nehemiah going back and rebuilding the wall, or in this case, digging up those wells because there are some deep wells and there is fresh water down there. Amen. We just haven't seen it and, and haven't tasted it for a long time, but there is an incredible rich heritage in this nation for sure. Amen. All right, Kim, got some more questions? I do. This one, this one's a little tougher, I think. Uh, Deborah on chat says, the USA is a racist country. Look at the levels of poverty, incarceration, and morbidity, levels based on race. Why are you in denial about this? Okay, so it seems more like an accusation than a question, but mm -hmm. I'm gonna take it as a question. Yeah. Um, yeah. So one of the things that, that is, is, is quite important, um, if you look at somewhere like the Brookings Institute, now the Brookings Institute is from a historically black university, and, and that is not what anybody would consider, right, a, a conservative bastion. Okay, the Brookings Institute said anybody that's born in poverty, there are three things they can do to get out of poverty. And they explained that the people that have done this, it's like a 99% success rate, the people that do three things. The three things are if they will graduate high school, if they will get a job, and if they won't have kids until they're married, meaning don't have kids out of wedlock, if they will do those three things, they can get out of poverty. Well, what we are seeing right now is this, this is this is not necessarily about black and white. This is actually much more, probably more consistent with inner city and not inner city. But the reality is that what we're seeing so often in some of these places is we're, we're not encouraging some of this behavior. In fact, if you look in the black community, 
the largest percentage of fatherless homes comes from the black community. And I'm not trying to be critical at all because we know that's a very growing percentage in Hispanic communities. It's a growing percentage in white communities. But what you see is the majority of problems come from homes where there is not a father. And this is, this is not pertinent as much to the color of skin as it is to the condition of the family. Because again, if you look at, at poverty, well, poverty, actually one of the greatest indicators of, of someone's economic stability is a father in the home. That is, that's a statistical fact. This is not something that I, I say lightly, but again, the reality, the Brookings Institute said, look, if someone's in poverty, it's pretty, pretty easy to get out, but you see people in the inner city. And again, this is regardless of the color of their skin, but so many of these Democrat run large cities, they, they, they have set up a position where they say, look, the government will take care of you. So, right, you drop out of high school, we're gonna take care of you. You, you have kids out of wedlock, we're gonna take care of you. You don't have a job, we're gonna take care of you. We are actually encouraging and incentivizing things that are ultimately harmful and destructive to individuals when we know God's ways ultimately are the best. And, and God designed marriage to be one father and one mother in a lifelong covenant union. That doesn't mean that, that there's not hard times and hard things. And, you know, God bless. I know there's people watching right now that have, have gone through divorce, and that's tough. And, man, I, I, I hate that for you. Man, God bless you. I, I hope you're doing okay. Obviously, call in the prayer line. There's people that want to help and pray for you. But the reality is, if we did it God's way, what we do know, the studies show that the students that, that perform the best academically, the students that have the best mental and emotional health, the students that are the least likely to go to jail, the students that are the most likely to graduate from college, and every statistical advantage is to kids that have a mother and father in the home. Now, th there's nothing you can point to about systemic racism keeping a mother and father from being together right now at 2023 in America. So uh, it's not to say that there has not been racism in America and that, of course, there's racist people in America because guess what? There's racist people all over the world. To imagine that only America has racism and only white people are racist, that's actually pretty racist, right? That would be like me saying, well, only Irish people can be prideful. But well, that's, that's kind of racist. Actually, it's really racist and it's not correct. Everybody is impacted by sin, including the sin of pride or racism, that that's not just limited to white people in America. But if we followed God's standards, this is something that regardless of, out, or, or, of starting place, outcomes can be different. And there's a lot of great examples like Ben Carson. Ben well, Carson? Tim, right, I'm sorry. Started, I've got to jump in here, brother, because uh, we're almost out of time. So the, I tried. Uh, you no. Know, we'll come back another time and have that conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so speaking of, of another time, uh, next week, uh, begins the new format for Truth and Liberty for our live cast as we're going to a daily program. Uh, the broadcast time is going to change to 3.30 p.m. Mountain Time, 5.30 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time. And uh, Andrew Womack, uh, Pastor Mark Cowart, uh, Alex McFarland, and myself are going to be your hosts. And it's going to be a live call-in program where you can actually call in and ask your questions over the air. And and uh, just like uh, you know, you've seen so many times on other programs, we are so excited about this. It's going to be awesome. Uh, check our website for more information on that. And as we close, I want to give thanks to CTN for carrying this live. And uh, thank you guys for watching. Thank you, Tim. You've been an amazing guest. And we'll see you all again next time on Truth and Liberty. Join us next time for the Truth and Liberty broadcast. Find tonight's episode and related articles and links at truthandliberty.net. Truth and Liberty is viewer supported. If you'd like to help us continue our live casts, you can make a donation at truthandliberty.net. 